హలో ఆస్పిరెంట్స్ వెల్కమ్ యూ ఆల్ టు ది హిందూ డైలీ న్యూస్ అనాలిసిస్ బ్రాట్ యూ బై శంకర్ ఐఎస్ అకాడమీ ఫర్ ద డేట్ ట్వంటీ ఫిఫ్త్ ఆఫ్ జనవరి ట్వంటీ ట్వంటీ త్రీ బిఫోర్ స్టార్టింగ్ అవర్ డిస్కషన్ ఐ హ్యావ్ అన్ అనౌన్స్మెంట్ రిగార్డింగ్ యువర్ ప్రిలిమ్స్ ప్రిపరేషన్ దిస్ ఈస్ అబౌట్ ది బ్యాచ్ ఫైవ్ ఆఫ్ ప్రీ స్ట్రామింగ్ ఎస్ ప్రీ స్ట్రామింగ్ బ్యాచ్ ఫైవ్ ఈస్ గోయింగ్ టు కమెంట్స్ ఫ్రమ్ డే ఆఫ్టర్ టుమారో ఇంట్రెస్టెడ్ ఆస్పిరెంట్స్ క్యాన్ యూస్ దిస్ ఆపర్చునిటీ అండ్ రిజిస్టర్ ది రిజిస్ట్రేషన్ లింక్ అండ్ ఫర్ ద డీటెయిల్స్ అబౌట్ దిస్ బ్యాచ్ ఈస్ ప్రొవైడెడ్ ఇన్ ది డిస్క్రిప్షన్ ఆఫ్ దిస్ వీడియో with this information now let's get into today's article discussion these are the articles which we are going to discuss today now let's start with the first article discussion take a look at this article given here it reports about the mass mortality of olive ridley turtles which has been observed near the northern coast of andhra pradesh dead olive ridley turtles were being washed ashore here over the past few weeks the effluents being released from the aqua ponds along the coastline and the discharges from the pipelines of the onshore oil exploration facilities are blamed for the mass mortality of the turtles in this context let us quickly revise few points about olive ridley turtles see the olive ridley turtles are the most abundant of all sea turtles found in the world they look very similar to kemp's ridley sea turtles know that these two species are the smallest of all sea turtles present in the world now talking about its other physical characteristics see olive ridleys generally grow up to 2 feet in length and 50 kg in weight males and females grow to the same size however females have a slightly more rounded shell as compared to its male counterparts Olive ridleys inhabited the warm waters of the Pacific, Atlantic and Indian Oceans. They have an olive green colored shell which is heart shaped and rounded. This is the exact reason why they are called as olive ridley turtles. Now coming to the question, what do they feed on? See, basically olive ridleys are carnivorous. That is, they are meat eaters and they generally feed on jellyfish, shrimps, snails, crabs, mollusks, and a variety of fishes. See, there is another phenomenon called Aribada which is associated with olive ridley turtles. These turtles spend their entire lives in the ocean and migrate thousands of kilometers for feeding and mating in the course of the year. So, during this migration process, they return to the same beach from where they first hatched to lay their eggs. During this phenomenal nesting period, up to 6 lakhs and more females emerge from the waters over a period of 5 to 7 days to lay eggs. This unique kind of mass nestling is only known as Aribada. Now moving on to see the various threats faced by olive ridley turtles. See, these turtles face threats due to human activities like unfriendly fishing practices, development and exploitation of nestling beaches for ports, and further development of tourist centers also threaten their population besides this also know that hatchlings survival rate is also very low it is estimated that approximately one hatchling survives to reach adulthood for every thousand hatchlings that enter the sea water from this data we can note that olive ridley turtles have very low survival rate from today's news article we can see that these sea turtles also face extinction challenge from polluted waters near the coasts this is why a large number of olive ridley turtles have been washed away recently now before ending our discussion we will see a few points regarding their conservation status see olive ridleys have been listed on schedule 1 of the indian wildlife protection act 1972 The species is also listed under the vulnerable category under IUCN. Then under sites, they are listed in Appendix 1. This is all about the conservation status of olive ridley turtles. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we have seen comprehensively about olive ridley turtles. With these learned points, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, take a look at this editorial. This editorial is titled as Working Hand in Hand to Showcase India. From the term Working Hand in Hand, we can come to a conclusion that this editorial is going to be based on the cooperation and coordination. But also note that this editorial deals with tourism in India. This article is being published in the Hindu today because 25th of January is the National Tourism Day. 
and on this occasion the ministry of railways is launching its jagannath yatra train package this train package is being done in partnership with the ministry of tourism this yatra is an 8 day tour that covers places of religious and cultural significance this is an initiative to highlight india's rich cultural heritage and history see this example quoted in the article is the railway ministry's initiative to showcase india's rich heritage so in this article discussion today we will see about the other initiatives which are being done by other ministries to showcase india but before that syllabus relevant for this article is highlighted here interested aspirants can go through it first of all know that promotion of indian tourism will be effective only when different ministries at the different levels of government come together to coordinate their actions knowing this fact only the tourism ministry worked on the task of interministerial cooperation and coordination government of india termed this exercise as whole of government approach now let us see few examples of this approach firstly tourism ministry combined with the ministry of home affairs organized the national conference on tourism police as you all already know there are certain places in india which are frequently visited by both foreign and domestic tourist and these particular areas need tourist specific policing this has to be done to stop the tourist from facing unruly experiences this national conference on tourist police was aimed at working with the police and sensitizing them on addressing the needs of foreign and domestic tourist this is about the first initiative secondly along with the ministry of education tourism ministry has established uva tourism clubs These clubs helps to nurture young ambassadors for Indian tourism. Thirdly, works has been done by the Ministry of Ports, Shipping and Waterways to make India an attractive cruise tourism destination. This is done by using state of the art infrastructure development. This field is concentrated because India's middle class is now prioritizing some of the discretionary spending on gaining new experiences. and this is exactly why infrastructure is being built to make india a cruise tourism destination here note that government of india has recently launched its first riverine cruise the said cruise is going to travel through the river ganga till bangladesh from there it switches itself into the path of brahmaputra upstream till dibrugarh which is located in assam this is all about cruise tourism fourthly in partnership with the ministry of external affairs tourism officers have been placed in 20 indian missions abroad here note that these countries are those that contribute to some of the highest foreign tourist arrivals in india here the tourist officers facilitate and provide inputs and these inputs will be made to reflect in tourism products finally even the ministry of roadways and the petroleum ministry are also taking steps to ensure that highways and fuel stations have clean sanitation infrastructure apart from this the tourism ministry is also funding several commercial flight routes in partnership with the ministry of civil aviation all these steps are taken by the tourism ministry along with the other ministries to boost tourism in india but according to the author who is a union minister himself this is not enough yes the author of this editorial is the union tourism minister and he is saying that works should be formalized through structures and institutions this is where newly drafted national tourism policy 2022 comes into play according to the author the policy was formulated after doing situational analysis the analysis included the past experiences such as the covid-19 and the future projections for the tourism sector One of the main idea of the policy includes an institutional structure that takes concurrent and coordinated action across the union state and the local government levels. As you all already know, India is going to host G20 summit this year. It will be hosting 20 countries, 11 special invitee countries and nearly 1 lakh delegates from these countries. They will all participate in 200 meetings at over 50 locations in India. if we take proper steps to promote tourism sector in india then every delegate who is coming to india will return to their home country as a brand ambassador for india here you may ask how can someone from other country be a brand ambassador for india 
See, if India can give them a good experience, then they will talk about India's rich cultural, spiritual and natural heritage, right? Through this, word will be spread about India's tourism sector all around the world. And this will promote India's tourism. You note that even when our Prime Minister visited Denmark earlier last year, he asked the Indian diaspora present there to inspire at least five of their non-Indian friends to visit India. And this is how India's tourism should be promoted. Adding to this, the Tourism Ministry declared Visit India year 2023. This declaration aims to promote various tourism products and destinations to increase India's share in the global tourism market. Finally, tourism should not be branded as an adventure activity or experience. It should be made an avenue to find oneself. India has always been a popular destination for travellers to explore their spiritual enlightenment and self-discovery. For centuries, many foreign great travellers have visited India. Their experiences are noted in the form of memoirs, travelogues, poetry and books. Some of the foreign travelers include Mahasthanas, Huanstang, Marco Polo and Fahiyan. They all came to India because India is the birthplace to four major world religions. The religions are Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism and Jainism. So, India can rightly claim that it is the world's spiritual beacon. All of these which we have discussed till now should be done to promote tourism industry in India. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we have seen about various initiatives which are being done by various ministries in collaboration with the Ministry of Tourism to promote tourism in India. Also, we saw about how India can attract tourists by projecting itself as a spiritual tourism hotspot. With these learned points, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. It reports that International Monetary Fund has confirmed that it has received India's written financing assurance to support Sri Lanka's economic revival. As you all already know, Sri Lanka is facing a severe economic crisis. This crisis is primarily based on the dwindling foreign exchange reserves of the country. Here note that Sri Lanka has huge foreign debt contributed mainly by three countries. The three countries are India, China and Japan. To solve the economic crisis, Sri Lanka has approached the International Monetary Fund for getting some money as loan. But IMF has said that it needs written assurance from the foreign creditors who have contributed to the debt of Sri Lanka. As India, China and Japan are the foreign creditors, these three countries need to give a written assurance saying that, that they are willing to restructure the loans given to Sri Lanka. After this process only, IMF will give money to the island nation. As I said already, this article has confirmed that India has given written financing assurance to the IMF regarding its loans given to Sri Lanka. This is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us revise some important aspects about the International Monetary Fund. See, the IMF or International Monetary Fund was established in the year 1944 in the aftermath of the Great Depression of the 1930s. Initially, 44 member countries sought to build a framework for international economic cooperation. But today, IMF has nearly 190 member countries. Basically, IMF is an organization that works with an objective to achieve sustainable growth and prosperity for all of its member countries. It does so by supporting economic policies that supports financial stability and monetary cooperation. First, we will see the organizational setup of IMF. The Board of Governors is the IMF's highest decision-making body. It consists of one governor and one alternate governor for each member country. The governor is appointed by the member country and he or she is usually the minister of finance or head of the central bank of that particular country. Here note that the board of governors is advised by two ministerial committees. The two committees are International Monetary and Financial Committee and the Development Committee. This is a brief background about organizational setup of IMF. Now coming to how IMF is financed. See, IMF's resources mainly come from the money that countries pay as their capital subscription when they become members. Here note that this capital subscription is also called as quotas. 
Each member of the IMF is assigned a quota which is broadly based on its relative position in the world economy. Countries can then borrow from this pool of money when they fall into financial difficulty. Normally, countries facing balance of payment crisis borrow from this large pool of fund. From this pool of fund which is collectively generated by the financing done by the member countries. This is how IMF raises its resources. Now coming to the question, how do IMF do this lending? As I said already, IMF provides loans to member countries experiencing actual or potential balance of payment problems. The aim here is to help them rebuild their international reserves, stabilize their currencies, continue paying for imports and restore conditions for strong economic growth. If you can recall, India was also facing a severe payment of balance crisis during the early years of 1990s. At this particular juncture, IMF came to India's side. This is how IMF helps member countries who are currently facing a balance of payment crisis. This is all about IMF. Before ending our discussion, we will also see about special drawing rights. See, the special drawing rights is an international reserve asset created by the IMF to supplement the official reserves of its member countries. Here note one important point, special drawing rights is not a currency. It is just a potential claim on the freely usable currencies of IMF members. As such, SDRs can provide a country with liquidity. A basket of currency make up the SDR. They include the US dollar, Euro, Chinese Yuan, Japanese Yen and the British Pound Sterling. We will briefly see about this SDR in a separate video. I have provided here the value of each currency present in the SDR. You can pause the video and go through it. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we have seen about the organizational setup of IMF and also its functioning. With these learned points, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Today's data point is taken from the National Family Health Survey 5. The data point discusses about the number of people who consume dark green leafy vegetables daily. The results are quite disappointing for the southern states, mainly Tamil Nadu. Now have a look at this graph. In the graph, you can see that in 2019 to 2021 period, only 10.6 percentage of women in Tamil Nadu consumed dark green leafy vegetables daily. In addition to this, there is a gender inequality component as well. Now look at this graph. This graph shows the share of men who consumed green leafy vegetables in the same time period. In Tamil Nadu, 42.5 percentage of men consumed green leafy vegetables daily. So from this we can conclude that basically while the men of Tamil Nadu are having healthy food, the women of Tamil Nadu are not having such healthy food. This is a major issue because there is a correlation between states with the highest level of anemia and states that have the lowest regular consumption of green leafy vegetables among women. As green leafy vegetables are a rich source of iron, folic acid, vitamin C, carotene and calcium, the state governments must ensure their availability and encourage its consumption with special emphasis on women. This is all about the data point given in today's Hindu. Now in our discussion today, let us focus on anemia from the prelims perspective. See anemia occurs when you have a decreased level of hemoglobin in your red blood cells. Hemoglobin is the protein in your RBCs that is responsible for carrying oxygen to your tissues. See, this particular disease is caused due to number of factors. One of the most common causes of anemia is iron deficiency. Iron deficiency anemia is a type of anemia. This occurs when our body doesn't have enough iron mineral. Our body needs iron to make hemoglobin. No iron means reduced production of hemoglobin which in turn results in anemia. It can also occur due to genetic reasons as well. Other than this, warm infections, internal bleeding and extensive blood discharge for women during the menstrual cycle are also the cause for rising anemia in women. The general symptoms of iron deficiency anemia are fatigue, weakness, pale skin, dizziness, cold hands and feet. As per the data from the National Family Health Survey 5, around 25% men in the age 15 to 49 years are anemic in India. The proportion increases to 57% in women and 52.2% in pregnant women in the same age group. 
This is why anemia is considered a significant public health challenge in India. So, government of India and various state governments has taken significant measures to address this particular problem. First measure is the supplementation interventions by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. For anemia, iron folic acid supplementation is provided through iron folic acid tablets. For this, National Iron Plus Initiative was launched. Under this, pregnant and lactating women and children in the age group of 60 to 60 months are provided iron folic acid supplementation. Another measure is providing supplementary nutrition. For example, under Integrated Child Development Services Scheme, supplementary nutrition is provided to pregnant and lactating women. Supplementary food is also provided to primary school children through the National Program of Nutritional Support to Primary Education that is Midday Meal Scheme. Then adolescent girls are covered under the scheme for adolescent girls. This particular scheme is shortly known as SAG. It focuses on out of school adolescent girls in the age group of 11 to 14 years. The scheme provides nutrition provision and also iron folic acid supplementation. Above all, in 2018, Anemia Mukt Bharat strategy was launched with the target to reduce anemia in women, children and adolescents. It includes preventive and curative mechanisms like the iron folic acid supplementation, intensified year-round behavioral change communication and testing and treatment of anemia. These are some of the steps taken by our government of India to address the high anemia prevalence in our country. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we have discussed about the data point which showed that women in the southern parts of India are not consuming enough green leafy vegetables. Due to this, there is a chance of anemia increasing in this part of our country. Other than this, we also saw about various initiatives launched by government of India to bring down the prevalence of anemia in India. With these points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this editorial displayed here. This article gives us an oversight about the challenges Pakistan is currently facing and it also talks about the recent outreach by Pakistani Prime Minister towards India. In a recent interview with a Dubai-based TV channel, Prime Minister of Pakistan said that Pakistan had learnt a lesson from three wars with India and now it wants to live in peace with its neighbour. Therefore, he called for serious and sincere talks with Prime Minister Modi on issues like the ongoing Kashmir problem. And as you all already know, Pakistan is currently facing a severe economic crisis. So, through this discussion, we will try to decode the points provided in the article and also we will understand the reasons for the current economic crisis which has engulfed Pakistan. Now, let us understand the different kind of challenges that Pakistan is currently facing. Firstly, let us understand the political challenges. See, the current government of Pakistan has to face elections later this year. So, it is facing huge challenges by the opposition-led former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Imran Khan has claimed that the current economic crisis is caused only by the actions of Sheriff's government. You note that Sheriff is the current Prime Minister. Now coming to the economic crisis. See, Pakistan is in imminent danger of a debt default. Here note that it is running its economic policies by the assurances of support received from the UAE, Saudi Arabia and China. It is further hoping that International Monetary Fund's bailout package will help it tide over this situation. Apart from this, Pakistan also faces a growing terror threat from its Afghan border. Despite Pakistan having a friendly relationship with the Taliban's, there are frequent violent clashes particularly with the Tehrik-e Taliban fighters. These particular group of Taliban fighters are in direct conflict with the Pakistan border forces in particular areas along the Pakistan-Afghan border. So, from all this, we can see that Pakistan is facing problems which are multidimensional in nature. Now, we will see how India can help Pakistan. As a reply to Pakistan PM's remarks, the Ministry of External Affairs of India responded that India wants normal relation with Pakistan. It said, if there is a conducive environment that is devoid of terrorism, hostility or violence, then India can normalize its relationship with its neighbour. Here know that India is preparing to host the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's summit later this year. 
therefore if the relationship with pakistan normalizes then india and pakistan can attend this regional group summit together then india is now holding the g20 presidency and it is also showing the desire to promote the concerns of the global south in the meets of g20 this would particularly benefit pakistan and put to the world the problems faced by it if there is peace between the nations apart from this india can help pakistan through its export of food grains see food prices are high in pakistan due to the imported inflation so these are some ways in which india can help pakistan to tide over this particular situation see currently pakistan faces a severe economic crisis which clearly portrays that pakistan requires external support pakistan's foreign exchange reserves are at dangerously low levels it is also facing high inflation due to the increase in fuel prices so the central bank of pakistan has raised interest rates sharply to address the problems faced by the pakistan's currency apart from this the rising food and fuel prices in pakistan are also causing huge financial stress to its population now we will see the reasons for this particular economic crisis pakistan's economic challenges are aggravated by the devastation brought by last year's flood the economy was struggling even before the floods that is pakistan's economic crisis has numerous causes the major causes of the crisis are weak governance and political instability he noted that pakistan is also highly import dependent particularly with regard to its energy needs so the hike in global oil and gas prices made pakistan more vulnerable this in turn affected the ordinary people of pakistan these are some of the reasons for the economic crisis which has engulfed the country with this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we have learned about the recent crisis which pakistan is facing with these learned points now let's move on to the next article discussion now have a look at this article it says that supreme court panel has questioned the need to revive oil palm plantations in andaman and nicobar islands the supreme court constituted central empowered committee also said that oil palm plantations might lead to encroachment of forest lands in the island groups and asked why the production of palm oil could not be taken up on the mainland india let me brief you all regarding the background of the case shortly see the supreme court in 2002 banned oil palm plantations in forest lands in andaman while relying on the shaker shing committee report this report had observed that existing plantations of oil palm rubber and teak are reportedly no longer viable and should be phased out following this nearly 1600 hectares of forest land under red oil palm cultivations were wounded up however the island administration filed a petition in the supreme court in 2018 seeking that the ban be lifted it wanted diversion of forest land for other purposes so this particular article has come in the newspaper as a continuation of the issue which i have discussed here with this information we will quickly learn about oil palm see in india palm oil is mostly used for cooking and for processing other packed foods such as ice creams and chocolates the national mission on edible oils seeks to decrease india's palm oil import bill The mission guidelines shows that India imported nearly 63.2 percentage of edible oil consumed in the country in 2015-16. This percentage has now eventually come down to only 52.07 percentage. So, to further boost domestic production and reduce imports, the government has decided to provide a minimum support price to farmers under this particular mission. This indicates that there is a push for oil palm cultivation from the government side. However, we see that ecologists have been raising concerns about the impact on ecology due to the cultivation of palm oil. Here, to understand their concern, we need to first learn about the oil palm cultivation. See, palm plantations are grown only in the tropical countries. The oil palm tree produces high quality oil used for cooking in developing countries. It is also used in food products, detergents, cosmetics and to a small extent in biofuel. Besides this, palm oil is a very productive crop and offers a far greater yield at a lower cost of production than other vegetable oils. Therefore, global production of this oil and its demand is increasing rapidly. 
As a result, the palm oil plantations are spreading across Asia, Africa and Latin America. But such expansion comes at the expense of tropical forests, which form critical habitats for many endangered species. So know that palm oil has been and it continues to be a major driver of deforestation of some of the world's most biodiverse forests. Before ending our discussion, we will see a few quick prelims pointers now. Palm oil comes from the fleshy fruit of oil palms. This oil palm is native to the coastal countries of West and Southwest Africa. It is extensively grown in Indonesia and Malaysia. This perennial crop has an economic lifespan of 30 years. Oil palm has a long gestation period and restricts income flow to farmers for at least initial 4 to 5 years of its growing. Now coming to the oil produced from this tree. See, the oil produced is resistant to oxidation and so can give products a longer shelf life. And also note that this particular oil is highly stable at high temperatures. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this short discussion, we came to know about palm plantation and its effect on the tropical forest present all over the world. With these points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Recently, our Vice President, Mr. Jagdeep Dankar, made a controversial statement. He said that the basic of any basic structure is the prevalence of supremacy of the mandate of people. Our Vice President also said that the mandate of the people is indicated in the preamble of our constitution in the term, we the people. That means the power resides in the people, their mandate, their wisdom. He further held that Indian parliament reflects the mind of the people. This editorial is written as a response to the statement made by our Vice President. The author of the editorial gives an alternative interpretation of the term, we the people. He talks about the need for separation of powers and basic structure doctrine. Then he goes on to compare the Indian democratic setup with that of US and UKs. Finally, the author talks about the ill effects of undermining judiciary. This is the overall theme of the editorial article given here. So, in our discussion, we will see the points mentioned by the author in a simple and a detailed manner. The syllabus for this particular discussion is highlighted here. You can go through it. Now, let us start our discussion with a question. What is the source of authority of the Indian constitution? The constitution draws its authority from the people and has been promulgated in the name of the people. This is evident from the preamble which states, We the people of India do hereby adopt, enact and give to ourselves this constitution. Here, who does the word people actually refer to? The constitution does not define the word people. So, there are differing opinions. For example, our vice president has interpreted the people as the common public and their elected representatives. This particular interpretation gives primacy or more importance to the elected members of the parliament and the state legislatures. According to the author, this is quite controversial. This is because we know that three pillars of democracy are parliament, judiciary and the executive. And for a modern democracy like India, separation of powers between the three pillars is important so that one does not dominate the other. But if we go by our vice president's interpretation of the term we the people as legislature is elected by the people and executive and judiciary is merely appointed, then there comes a conclusion that judiciary and the executive are inferior to the legislature. Although our vice president did not explicitly say this, this is a conclusion that can be derived from a statement we the people means the power resides in the people, their mandate, their wisdom. Indian parliament reflects the mind of the people. This is why the author of this editorial finds the statement made by the vice president controversial. According to the author, identifying the legislature as the sole representatives of the people will set a bad precedent. This will affect the theory of separation of powers which is basic to any democratic polity. Now, let us see briefly about separation of powers. According to the doctrine of separation of powers, there should be a separation between the legislature, executive and judicial functions of the government. What is the need for separation of powers? See, the doctrine of separation of powers ensures that no one organ of government has all the powers rested with itself. In addition to this, there is also the presence of checks and balances between the various organs. Checks and balances ensure that 
no one organ becomes all too powerful this ensures that india does not fall into autocratic rule due to the importance of separation of power our constitution makers incorporated it into our constitution itself we can find that in the article 50 which says that the state should take steps to separate judiciary from executive article 121 places a restriction on the parliament on the discussion regarding the conduct of judges of supreme court and high court article 211 places the same restrictions on the state legislature also these are the some of the provisions present in the constitution which ensures the separation of powers the judiciary on its part in the famous kesavananda bharathi case 1973 pronounced that separation of power is a part of the basic structure the supreme court reiterated the same view in the raj narain versus indira gandhi case of 1975 this is all about the term separation of powers now coming back to the article today there is a power struggle between the government and the supreme court the supreme court is not yielding to the pressures of the central government it is refusing to deviate from its constitutional responsibilities through the judicial invention of basic structure doctrine the judiciary is protecting the overreach by the government and the legislature here the term government refers to the executive but the government of india is of the opinion that power of the people which is expressed through a legitimate platform should be the ultimate guiding force and not the basic structure invented by the judiciary the author of this editorial is of the opinion that so there is some merit to the government arguments the central government is following double standards since the present government took office the central government has been trying to control the legitimately elected state government through the office of governor the issue has assumed such a proportion that there is now a virtual war in the country between the elected governments in some states and the governors our vice president who is now talking so much about the will of the people and the significance of the elected representatives created so much ruckus when he was serving as the governor of west bengal so the author is saying that this is some serious double standards which is being exhibited by the central government in other words the separation of powers acceptable to the center is not applied to the states this action of the government makes one question the real intention behind the recent statements made by our union law minister and our vice president according to this author the recent actions of the central government just indicates one thing he says that central government is trying to dominate both the state government and the judiciary if this mindset of the central government is not altered then very soon india might turn into a totalitarian state here note that all the points which i have discussed till now are the opinion of the author who has written this particular editorial this is all with regard to this particular article discussion in this discussion we saw the major points mentioned in the article in detail we saw about the recent statements made by the vice president of india and the author's opinion regarding it we also saw about the principle of separation of powers and the constitutional provisions safeguarding the separation of powers with these learned points now let's move on to the next article discussion now have a look at this news article displayed here It says that the Egyptian president Abdel Fattah El Sisi has come to India for the Republican Day celebrations. Know that Mr Sisi is the first Egyptian leader to be invited as the chief guest for the Republic Day parade. The invitation to Mr Sisi is seen as part of the government of India's push to engage the global south and it is also seen as rekindling the principles of non-alignment. See non-alignment as a political philosophy has come to the forefront once again after the Russia Ukraine war. So in this discussion we will see the basic tenets behind the non-alignment movement. Non-alignment movement as a political ideology was born on the backdrop of the Cold War. See Cold War was an ideological war which was fought between capitalistic bloc led by US and the communist bloc led by the USSR. it nearly stretched over 45 years during this 45 years many proxy wars were fought all around the world some of the examples are vietnam war and the korea war the cold war period stretched from the end of the second world war to the fall of the soviet union in the 1990s here note that some newly independent countries opted for non alignment this means that these countries chose not to support either us or the ussr and this movement was only called as non alignment movement 
know that in the year 1955 representatives from 29 governments of asian and african nations gathered in bandung indonesia they all gathered to discuss peace and the role of third world in the cold war here the word third world refers to the newly independent countries which came out of colonialization non alignment movement majorly focused on economic development and decolonization at this bandung conference only final resolution for the foundation of non alignment movement was put forward the founding fathers of the non alignment movement include yugoslavian president tito indian prime minister jawaharlal nehru egyptian president abdul nasser ghana president kruma and indonesian president sukarno now let us see the objectives of non alignment movement see the objectives of non alignment movement are twofold Firstly it was formed to avoid countries joining either of the two great power blocks led by the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War the second one is to support principles of national independence and territorial integrity against domination by the great powers of the western years accordingly in the 1955 asian african conference 10 principles guided the efforts of developing countries to promote peace and cooperation in the world I have given here the list of those principles just go through it with this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we have seen about the origin of non alignment movement and the twofold objectives of it with these learned points now let's move on to the prelims practice question discussion today i am going to discuss four different questions now starting with the first question it is a three statement question and we have to choose the correct statements the question is regarding oil palm now coming to the first statement Palm oil is currently the world's most consumed vegetable oil. See, the statement is correct. Palm oil is currently the world's most consumed vegetable oil. This is due to the fact that palm oil cost is very low when compared with the other edible oils. So, statement one is correct. Now, coming to the second statement, it is used in the production of plastics. Yes, this statement is also correct. Palm oil is used extensively in the production of detergents, plastics, cosmetics, and biofuels. So statement 2 is also correct. Now coming to the third statement. India's vegetable oil economy is the fourth largest in the world. This statement is little difficult, but if you know statement 1 and 2 are correct, you can directly choose the correct answer that is option D because that is the only option which contains both 1 and 2. See, India's vegetable oil economy is the world's fourth largest after the US, China and Brazil. So option 3 is also correct. So the correct answer for this question is option D 1 2 and 3 Now moving on to the second question this question is related to National Nutritional Anemia Control Program two statements are given and we have to choose the incorrect statement Now coming to the first statement it is implemented through the primary health centers see this statement is correct this particular program regarding anemia is implemented through the PHCs Now coming to the second statement it aims at decreasing the prevalence and incidence of anemia in women of reproductive age as we all know anemia is a disease which affects women disproportionately so this program is aimed at decreasing the prevalence of anemia in women of reproductive age so statement 2 is correct now let's see a few points regarding this particular mission this particular mission focuses on three vital strategies The first one is the promotion of regular consumption of foods rich in iron provisions of iron intake in the form of tablets to the high risk groups. The second strategy is the identification of anemic population and the third one is the treatment of those identified with anemia. As I already said option 1 and 2 are correct here but the question asks for the incorrect statement so the correct answer for this question is option D neither 1 nor 2. Now moving on to the third question See this is a three statement question regarding olive ridley turtles now coming to statement 1 operation olivia to protect olive ridley turtles was initiated by geological survey of india see this statement is wrong operation olivia was initiated by the indian coast guards so statement 1 is wrong now coming to the second statement to reduce accidental killing the odisha government has made it mandatory for trolls to use turtle excluder devices See this statement is correct. Recently, Orissa government has made it mandatory for trolls to use turtle excluder devices. So, statement 2 is correct. Now, coming to the third statement. The Indian Coast Guards are carrying out tagging of olive ridley turtles. See, this statement is wrong. Geological Survey of India only carries out the tagging of olive ridley turtles. 
if you can pay attention you can see that the organizations present in the statement 1 and 3 are swapped so both these statements are wrong the correct answer for this question is option b 2 only now moving on to the final question this question is regarding non alignment movement two statements are given and here also we have to find the correct statement now coming to the first statement the first non alignment movement summit conference took place in belgrade yugoslavia in september 1959 As we already saw in our discussion this statement is wrong the first summit took place in Bandung Indonesia now coming to the second statement Belarus and Azerbaijan are the only countries in Europe who are member of non alignment movement see this statement is correct both these countries are the only countries from Europe who are members of NAM at present the movement has 120 member states 17 observer countries and 10 observer organizations Member states include 53 from Africa, 39 from Asia, 26 from Latin America and Caribbean and only 2 from Europe. And these two countries are those countries. So the correct answer for this question is option B, 2 only. The quiz question for you all is displayed here. Interested aspirants can solve this question and post the correct answer in the comment section. The mains practice question is displayed here. interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section with this we have come to the end of our discussion if you have liked our video please hit the like button do comment and share it with your friends thank you for listening